Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer by Franklin Hall About this book In 1946 and 1947, a great movement of fasting and prayer was spawned, first in America and then the rest of the world. Franklin Hall's book, Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer, was the spark that ignited the hearts of thousands to go on extended fasts to seek God for revival and the restoration of spiritual gifts to the church. Many went on 40-day fasts. In 1947-1952, the Great Healing Revival broke out through the ministries of William Branham, Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, and a host of others who began to experience gifts of Holy Spirit. They began to see extraordinary miracles in their ministries and thousands were converted and healed. Most of these itinerant evangelists followed Hall's practice of fasting. In 1948, the latter rain outpouring visited northern Battleford, Canada and swept into the United States. The leaders all agreed that it was after reading Atomic Power that they entered a season of the grace of fasting, which, after three months, resulted in a powerful outpouring of the Spirit restoring spiritual gifts and ministries to the church. It also led them into employing the laying on of hands for healing and for imparting the gift of the Holy Spirit. The truth of fasting with prayer was a major catalyst in this revival. Introduction Worldwide Fasting Prayer Crusade January 1946 in 1946, a group of saints came together in San Diego from various denominations to hear the teaching of Jesus Christ's gospel concerning prayer and fasting. Many of these Christians entered into consecration fasts. A real test was made as to the efficacy of fasting. Some of these fasts were from 21 to more than 60 days in continuous duration without food. They were burdened to see the Lord move in a special spiritual way. These and many others wanted to see a worldwide revival for the salvation and healing of mankind and the restoration of the gifts of the Spirit. The amazing results as these scores of the Christians united in fasting and praying were stupendous. Many miracles of healing were performed by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Demons were cast out, lunatics healed, cancers disappeared, the blind saw, the crippled walked, stomach ulcers disappeared, palsy was quieted, tuberculosis healed, asthma, bronchitis, the smoking and drinking habits were given up, and many more sicknesses vanished. Scores of folks were baptized at the altars. In this revival auditorium that the author was temporarily in charge of, we were privileged to see a thousand souls find Jesus that year. These converts were mostly servicemen from various parts of the nation. They also helped to carry the message across the seas. A continuous chain of fasting and all-night prayer meetings conducted by Sister Helen Hall went on for many months. She writes, I went into 21 days of fasting. In the next revival meeting after this fast, we saw over 3,000 souls saved. I could lay hands on the sick and they would recover, arthritis, TB, etc. It was in the midst of these fasting prayer revivals that this volume was born. From then on, God burdened the author to launch a fasting and prayer crusade. Soon, many other ministers and spiritual saints of God became burdened to encourage and teach prayer and fasting in a greater way. Folks began fasting in Los Angeles and Southern California, and then it spread throughout the West and north into Canada. Folks began fasting and praying across the nation. Soon, this most powerful message had gone throughout the world. Men and women travailed, and the most powerful prayer prayed under the influence of the consecration fast. Such soul hunger and travail moved the hand of God and opened the windows of heaven, and God poured out His Spirit and power in a mighty way. Many calls, yes, thousands of letters would pour in from all parts of the world asking for information on the deeper fastings, for truth that would take them deeper and deeper with the Lord and open the doors so they could have more of the Holy Spirit and His gifts. Even before atomic power with God was off the press, orders had come in for approximately 5,000 copies and requests for thousands of pieces of literature. This was a major financial problem. But our Lord supplied the need and members of the body of Jesus made it possible to print millions of tracts on a subject sadly neglected and overlooked, yet at our very fingertips. Thousands of wonderful testimonies poured in from all over the world, verifying the mighty power of fasting and prayer. They testified to all kinds of remarkable answers to fasting prayer. 
that the fasting type of prayer is far more effectual than ordinary prayer. The author launched fasting and prayer revivals throughout the nation. Auditoriums were filled with crowds varying from 1,000 to 14,000. These were non-sectarian for all churches. This started thousands of people fasting and praying for a worldwide revival. This mighty tide of fasting proceeded and was a prelude to the major evangelistic healing campaigns that are stirring Christendom today, in which hundreds and even thousands are converted in a single campaign. We wish to express our appreciation to Christians everywhere for helping to do their part in spreading worldwide this glorious part of our Jesus' message, fasting and prayer. Evangelist T. L. Osborne as given to the author while visiting from brother and sister Osborne in their new house trailer during their wonderful tent cathedral campaign in Reading, Pennsylvania, where 3,000 souls found Jesus as their Savior and many hundreds were healed from all manner of diseases. The East was stirred by this campaign. Thousands were packed around the tent. We were happy to let you know that we feel our lives have been revolutionized by fasting and praying to Jesus. It was by reading your books that we were enabled to go into many days and weeks fasting and praying. Both my wife and I have had many deep fasting and prayer experiences. My life was so changed that God began using me in the healing ministry. As I began to exercise the ministry of praying for the sick, more and more folks were healed. One day, while in deep consecration, the Spirit spoke thus, my son, as I was with Price, Wigglesworth, and others, so will I be with thee. They are dead, but now it is time for you to arise, to go and do likewise. You can cast out devils. You heal the sick. You raise the dead. You cleanse the lepers. Behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Be not afraid. Be strong. Be of good courage. I am with thee, as I was with them. No evil power shall be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As you get the people to believe my word, I used those men in their day, now I desire to use thee. The challenge of this commission given directly from the Lord caused me to tremble exceedingly, but I knew God meant every word he had spoken. More days and weeks of fasting and prayer followed this tremendous commission, and more healing and miracles were the result. We have been able to conduct healing campaigns already in over a dozen of our states and on the island of Jamaica, in a single campaign which we conducted as many as 125 deaf mutes, 90 totally blind, and hundreds of other equally miraculous deliverances have resulted. Happy and joyful conversions have numbered as many as 9,000 in one revival. We found people all over the island acquainted with your books and tracts. Many were fasting and praying for this revival before we came. Brother Hall, we wanted you to know, we do appreciate your vision and the tremendous way you have stirred the world with fasting and prayer. We shall do all we can to push that part of the gospel. We are going to handle your books in our meetings and shall order them in large quantities. You may send me 1,000 of your Because of Your Unbelief Revival booklets. Yours in Christ for the deliverance of all, T. L. Osborne. Testimony from Evangelist M. A. Dowd, Madagascar. Dear Brother and Sister Hall, Through some of our workers we learn that you are planning a missionary trip to this area. We have used your books and practiced consecrate fasting for years and have enjoyed them so much. We have taught the natives from them and hundreds have benefited from fasting and the teachings of these truths. We will be happy to translate them into Malagasy language in this French colony. Our new tabernacle seats 6,000 and you will be able to minister to an overflow crowd in the building. Nearby, we have facilities to accommodate over 40,000 people. Your deliverance, fasting, and prayer ministry should stir the island. We have the only Pentecostal church on the island of more than 6 million. When we first came here in 1961, the crowds reached even to 50,000 people. Please write us your wishes as soon as you can so we can start to work on it. We are looking forward with joy in having you minister with us in Madagascar. Sincerely in him, brother and sister M. A. Dodd. Dear Brother Hall, Someone was kind enough to give me your book, Atomic Power with God Through Fasting. It is tremendous. Most publishers across the years, in a half dozen different languages, send me their books for review, knowing that my reviews will reach clientele that no other medium can touch. May I impose upon you by asking you to send me for review any other book of yours that you would like for me to read and to hold. Thank you very much for your undoubted curiosity in this matter. Faithfully and gratefully yours, Hyman Appleman.
Gordon Lindsay. We believe that there is a great truth in prayer and fasting since Jesus, when speaking of the devil and the lunatic child, whom the disciples could not heal, declared, This kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. We do realize that fasting to be seen of men for self-aggrandizement is futile and profitless, but fasting with prayer has a place as the scriptures plainly teach. We know of no writer whom God has no, so signally used to bring out scriptural truth on fasting as evangelist Franklin Hall. We feel that Atomic Power with God is the book of the hour for believers. We trust that this book will be a special help to those whose prayers, for one reason or another, have not been answered. Many of the associates of the Voice of Healing magazine, like me, feel that fasting and prayer should have an important place in a successful salvation healing ministry. Brother Gordon Lindsay, Boy Evangelist Little David was born in Phoenix, Arizona, September 20th, 1934. He sang his first song at two years of age. He prayed his first prayer at three years of age. At five, little David was about to go blind. He went on a three-day fast with prayer, going into the woods with some other little boys to pray. Satan talked to him and tried to discourage him the first day, but he kept praying and fasting. On the third day, he went into the woods again and his prayer became more intense. The fast became prayer too. The windows of heaven opened and he received the Holy Spirit after the Bible pattern, and instantly he was completely healed and came home shouting. At the age of six, he had another wonderful experience. At seven, he was injured by a taxi cab and again healed in answer to prayer. At nine years of age, he was called to preach. At that age, his spirit left the body, and for five hours, little David was in heaven. A great light flashed in front of him, and he was called into the ministry. Jesus told me to go open my mouth, and he would fill it. I also received knowledge of many things that are going to come to pass, stated little David. There is much more to this remarkable story of little David than appears on the surface. Let us go back before he was born. Little David's father, Brother Jack Walker, was not seeing souls saved. He became heavily burdened, crying out to God almost night and day, and still he was not satisfied. Then he undertook a fast and almost ceaseless agony and prayer for lost men and women. He received from the somber heavens above a ray of hope, although he did not know what it was all about. This much he did know, and that was that God had answered his prayer. He felt that victory was his without a shadow of a doubt. His fast and prayer lasted 14 days. Immediately at the conclusion of this fast, a soul was given to the parents, and nine months later his son David was born. This child evangelist was to do more than his father could ever do, and was very definitely given an answer to most fervent prayers and fasting. Child and women preachers are last day signs that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. See Joel 2.28. The Lord Jesus has been waiting 2,000 or more years for some group, small or large, to actually be willing to receive the fullness of this purchase price, complete redemption work. Happily, the man-child is the first group to actually believe, qualifying themselves to receive the full perfect redemption which Jesus provided. The greatest ministry of all time is emerging. The full bought redemption salvation ingredients are now coming forth, emerging not from the popular deliverance and fundamental group of ministers and church systems, but out of a small dressing room, maternity ward chamber, so to speak. The man child will end up with the kingdom of heaven's stone, grown into a mountain kingdom, drawn for and around Jesus Christ, the king of glory in his everlasting kingdom. Glory of the cloths. Fasting enables the Lord's people to properly discern the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11, 29 and 30. The Lord's glory body from attaining the glory of the cross from His ascension back up in glory. His expedient returns to glory that He could bring it back to us through the Holy Spirit, full baptism. Only one part of our salvation has seemingly been taught. The sin problem, eliminated by Jesus shed of blood, the shortness of glory portion. See Romans 3.23 For all have sinned, this portion taught over and over, and come short of the glory of God. The latter portion is the most important for full redemption attainment, yet it has deplorably, deplorably been left out. Attention was called to the reader above, 
at least three persons who fasted much did enter into a portion, if not all of the shortness of glory, covering comforter, baptism of Holy Ghost, fire, the restoration of lost garments of Adam and Eve, the garments of salvation, Isaiah 61.10, the glory that is seen upon one, Isaiah 6, 1 through 60, 1 through 5, 21 and 22. Also, the protective ingredients illustrated above, outlined in Isaiah 4, 5, one cloud, two smoke, three fire, and four light. This is the most important teaching in this volume of fasting results. Fasting properly unto our Lord brings forth the glory of the cross, enabling God's people to come into full realization that we may also obtain a fundamental body felt as well as the fundamental heartfelt salvation experience. The promise of the Father to come upon us Luke 24, 49, Acts 1, 4, Acts 8, Acts 2, 3, Acts 17, Acts 19, Revelations 3, 17, and 18, etc. Salvation in our heart is not enough. Salvation upon us heals, protects from all harm, and is accident sickness prevention. The ultimate goal and accomplishment of the cross has never been reached because only the shame of the cross has ever dared to be preached. The three men recorded to have fasted 40 days demonstrated the glory of the cross. Moses received body felt salvation, substance, glory of the Lord upon his person. Elijah received the glory of the cross substance so mightily upon himself that he was translated without seeing death. Jesus Christ, who found it necessary to empty himself first of his Shekinah glory, paying the cost price shame of the cross, then afterwards arose from the dead, but his resurrection was not enough. It was likewise necessary for him to get back up into his glory and be thereby reestablished in it that we too may possess the protective glory of the cross, substance which is the kingdom of heaven glory. Chapter 1. Atomic Power with God Fear and hatred stalk the world today. No one knows to what use men will put the newly discovered force of atomic energy. Many other devices of power would bring to pass the signs preceding the second coming of Christ, as foretold in Luke 21 through 20, Luke 21, 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And the cause of it all is the sad fact that man's spiritual development has lagged far behind his scientific development with his many inventions and discoveries of the physical forces of nature. Spiritually and emotionally, mankind as a whole is not far removed from the jungles and is therefore incapable of handling the forces of nature that science has unleashed. Physical power, sufficient to disintegrate the entire world, is at the fingertips of a few, but there has been almost no development of spiritual power to control it. We have been wandering in the wilderness. This spiritual power is actually within the reach of all followers of Christ. It is not so much that it has been forgotten, but rather that it has never been taught and learned. The message of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, 16. But we have overlooked a certain fundamental part of the gospel message. The writer shall endeavor to present a spiritual atomic power far greater than the physical force of all the atoms in the universe. Jesus Christ has made this power available to all His people who will follow His gospel pattern. In 1848 AD, the Aquarian Age was introduced to the world. The era of invention began and the machine came into being along with the Age of Speed. Space and time began to shrink with the modern automobile, steam engine, and airplane. Distance ceased to be a barrier. More progress and scientific achievement was made in two generations than had been accomplished in the preceding 2,000 years. What about spiritual power? Except for a sprinkling here and there of the power of the Holy Spirit, scientific achievement has far outdistanced man's gain in these things of the Spirit. In the natural, we have the automobile to speed us on our way. We have the steam engine shortening distance and also the airplane making distance no longer a barrier, etc. Radar and television bring distant objects nearer. 
Surely, if man's scientific achievement has increased in momentum, there must also be something to be found somewhere in the Word of God that will accelerate his spiritual progress. Like most scriptural truths, there is something, but only the wise shall understand it. The seemingly insignificance and misunderstanding may have been caused for its neglect. This latent power is fasting and prayer. This is a prayer that is prayed under the influence of fasting. Our spiritual progress will be supersonic speed. Thank God there is something which makes for spiritual progress that is more scientific than anything man has accomplished to date and which accomplishes wonders for our spiritual welfare in a very short time. Without this knowledge, this goal might not be attained for many years or perhaps never. That something is fasting and prayer. Our ultimate aim and desire should be the exalting of Jesus Christ and the glorifying of Him. Without prayer and fasting, every Christian will more or less mark time and fail in their purpose. The most successful and the quickest method is through prayer and fasting. This pleases Jesus, and in pleasing Him, we are availing ourselves of great opportunities. Delight thyself in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Fasting and prayer make it far easier to delight ourselves in the Lord. It will give us the light on this power. Space and time to God will shrink and distance will cease to be. When one receives the potential light and puts it into practice, if, as many believe, the unleashing of atomic energy is the prelude to the end of the earth, and if the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the vile judgments of revelation will soon be upon us, then the few who know and experience the saving power of God will do well to protect themselves against the day of His wrath by a last great awakening through fasting and prayer. It will be the beginning of a new age for good. If the power of the Spirit is developed to a high degree by many through the use of the most powerful agent known to man, Fasting and prayer. Without fasting, prayer becomes ineffectual. Fasting restores and amplifies prayer power. A 21 or 40 day prayer and fast will most assuredly hasten the Christian to such a deep and wonderful experience with God that 21 days will equal 21 years. 40 days will equal 40 years. Experience shows that the 40 day period brings far greater results than a shorter time. It will bring one closer to God more quickly than any other way. Like the doctrine of divine healing, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the truth of fasting has been sadly neglected. Many other forgotten Bible truths have been temporarily lost, only to be revived again in these latter days of this dispensation, the transition period between this and the millennial dispensation. The truth of fasting is being revealed to us now that we may secure the greater things of God that we may receive the gifts of the Spirit, and that a mighty worldwide revival of spiritual power will sweep over the world with major signs and miracles in these last days. Fasting is the most potent power of the universe and is placed at the disposal of every believer. A transformation in the body of Christ will begin as Christians fast and pray. The practice of fasting is as old as humanity. More than 2,000 years ago, fasting was a custom advocated by the school of the natural philosopher Asclepiades for curative purposes. The Roman historian Plutarch said, Instead of using medicine, fast a day. Traces of ancient fasting are to be found in ancient Chinese and Hindu writings. The Indians also practiced it. It was used for religious purposes as well as a method of restoring health. In the olden days, they recognized the value of a fast, but today people look on fasting as a certain way to the grave. When a person speaks of fasting 10 days, 21 days or more, many think it is something horrible. It is though it is through a lack of definite knowledge on the part of many that this subject is so much misunderstood. Fasting is a cornerstone of the Christian religion, yet there is seldom, if ever, a complete sermon on the subject. Moreover, it is an important basic truth of the Bible, yet we so often overlook its value. So important is fasting in the Mohammedan religion that they claim it to be one of the four pillars of the Mohammedan faith. This explains one of the reasons why there is more fervor and zeal in their religion than in the Catholic or Protestant religions. Many Mohammedans make a 30-day fast every year. Fervor and zeal are definitely a result of the fast. This is sadly lacking in our church of today. Fasting is mentioned in the scriptures approximately one-third as much as prayer, yet our present-day church member places it insignificantly in the background. 
If Christians realized what great power and blessings they are missing, they would be only too eager and happy to fast. One of the reasons Satan cheats them out of this glorious experience is through the misunderstanding and confusion that is so generally prevalent in regarding to fast. Here is a testimony of a certain man who fasted 14 days in one of my meetings. This was in 1945 when the worldwide fasting crusade was first launched. Underweight gains pounds after fasting. On the 31st day of December 1945, after hearing Reverend Franklin Hall on some enlightening teaching on fasting, I started a consecration fast. I partook of no food during the entire fast of 14 days. Water was taken for the purpose of cleaning out the system. I was a heavy smoker and it seemed impossible to give it up. But on the third day of the fast, I had no further desire for smoking. On the fourth day of the fast, hunger left me entirely. A little later, all weakness left. And to my surprise, I began feeling better and stronger day by day. I could pray more earnestly and with greater results. Several days later, I received the glorious baptism of the Holy Ghost. I kept busy with my work, which was not heavy. The fasting did not bother me much. What Brother Hall tells you about fasting is true. In our new spiritual consciousness, our eyes are open to discern the true nature of our former natural environment. And it worked out just that way in my life. It was a glorious experience. When I began the fast, I weighed 140 pounds. This was 29 pounds underweight. At that conclusion of the fast, 14 days later, I had lost 16 pounds, for I weighed 124 pounds. 60 days later, I had not only gained the lost weight, but also gained 29 pounds more, which was exactly what a man of my age should weigh to the pound, that is 169 pounds. Everyone told me that I looked better than they had ever seen me look, and I do feel better than I have felt for 20 years. All of my nervousness is gone, and I have better complexion, and best of all, I have received the Holy Ghost and have a much deeper experience with the Lord. My fast was shorter than many of the other brothers and sisters, but some day I hope to take a 40-day fast, as it certainly was a glorious experience to fast 14 days. People do not know what they are missing. Charles Wilson, San Diego, California. When we speak of atomic power with God, we are using a term expressing something great, and atomic power is as God, good, and experience as we could possibly find to fill the bill. We are not exaggerating in the least when we compare fasting and praying with the power of the atomic bomb, because to the Christian, fasting will truly bring atomic spiritual power. Atomic bomb. Robert DeVore in Coyers quotes some of the figures released by the Mission of Investigation in Japan on the atomic bomb. The Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs probably detonated at about 1,800 feet altitude. At 2,500 feet from point of impact, if bomb had reached Earth, not from the point of explosion, 1,800 feet above, which would be further, the pressure exerted was approximately 6 tons to the square foot. At 4,200 feet, the pressure was a little more than 1 ton per square foot. The first pressure noted above is equivalent to a gale force of wind at 150 miles per hour multiplied by 133, which equals the pressure of a wind blowing 20,000 miles per hour. The second pressure noted is equivalent to 24 times the pressure of a 150 mile gale equals pressure of a 3, 600 mile per hour hurricane. These enormous pressures are not wholly instantaneous but are slightly delayed in their application, giving the water time to partially yield and hence build up enormous wave effects. A vast cone-shaped vortex is created with a terrific outthrust and subsequent return of the displaced waters. No one can possibly calculate the true extent of this effect, but some physicists have stated that a wave of great height will be created. Consider the effect on water of the temperatures developed. The temperature of the atomic sun is estimated at 4 million degrees Fahrenheit. Combustible materials of all kinds will burn at 1.4 miles distant. The ground temperature below the burst at 1,800 feet altitude was certainly more than 1,500 degrees centigrade. Water was instantly vaporized, says DeVore. Forests were scorched at 8,000 feet distance. All these facts point to the instantaneous vaporization of millions of tons of water to be thrown far into the upper atmosphere and thence precipitated in torrential rains in distant parts of the world. This isn't a bomb at all, says General Farrell. 
These are the fires of the universe, says physicist Walter Graham. This is the great natural power that man has discovered. But greater still and more potent is the spiritual atomic power with God that lies available to every Christian. The scientist can now use and harness the power of the material atom, but the Christian can use and harness the dynamic power of the great creator of the atom. As the creator is greater than that which he has created, so is the power wielded by the Christian through fasting and prayer, greater than that wielded by the atomic scientist. It is the purpose of this volume to show the Christian a sure method, whereby he may obtain his mighty power and may be able to move the omnipotent hand of God. This will be our spiritual atomic jet propulsion power. Chapter 2. What is fasting? Let us see what the word fast means. I believe misunderstanding here causes much of our trouble about the subject of fasting. It is here that Satan deceives the average Christian. Webster's and also the Bible Dictionary define fasting as abstinence from food, especially as a religious observance, fast, to abstain from food. Now, what does Webster say about water as a food? Or we may ask the question, is water food? First, we will consider Webster's definition of food, and it reads as follows, food, nutriment, nourishment in solid form. Food and water drinking are two different things. To do without water results in thirsting, and thirsting means a great desire to drink. Fasting will be understood better if we would recognize these facts. One should not associate abstinence from water with the subject of fasting. Thus, we see the contradistinction between food and water. The confusion that exists in the mind of the Christian who believes that he is not to drink water in a fast must be overcome. This has prevented many people from fasting over a period of several days. Therefore, they have been deprived of some of the very great blessings. We will describe the protracted fast or a complete fast. We are dealing with the type of fast taken by the Lord Jesus Christ, a fast like that of Paul or Daniel, Bible fast. A complete fast is a fast from the time hunger leaves until the time hunger returns. Such a fast may continue from 21 to 40 days, depending on the individual and also on the amount of time it takes you to get your prayers through to heaven. Fasting and starvation are also two entirely different things. Drinking water when fasting. To take a fast of this particular type, one must of necessity drink water. It is absurd for people to think about fasting and prayer without drinking water. Those who do this do it in ignorance and should be corrected by some constructive teaching. However, one may attempt a fast of a few days without drinking water and find these facts to be immaterial. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and to attempt a major fast without water would defile and pollute the body. Scripture states, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Instructions are given by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6:16 6, through 18 that when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Washing the face is a sign of cleanliness. If it is good to wash your face to keep the toxin stains from face and body, washing being a type of cleanliness before God, then how much more logical it is to put water in your mouth, to clean out the corruption in the stomach. The stomach becomes deflated, collapsed, and depressed when water is withheld long enough, and a person gets into a bad shape. Without water, when fasting, the system will choke up, and the body becomes filthy internally. The tongue in the upper part of the stomach becomes heavily coated when fasting, showing visibly a part of the pollution that is in the stomach. Some doctors maintain that some food particles remain in the intestinal tract for more than a month until putrefaction is worse than any garbage pail. For the first few days of the fast, the stomach, tongue, and body become heavily laden with the corruption that is trying to loosen itself. These particles that have remained in the stomach unassimilated with other fecal matter require a great deal of water to break them down and to help soften this material so that it can be eliminated. Cramps, displeasure, misery, and other discomforts are frequently experienced during this initial period. 
Water aids in the loosening of so- and softening of this fecal matter without which the corruption will harden. The worms and bugs, which are nearly always present to some extent, will dry up on the intestines. The tongue will eventually thicken, and if the thirsting fast is prolonged, the individual will die unless the Lord intervenes. Paul knew the difference between thirsting and fasting. He distinguishes them in 2 Corinthians 11.27, and hunger and thirst and fastings often. If hunger and thirst were the same thing as fasting, he would not have repeated the same thing, any more than cold and nakedness are the same. Please note that a comma is inserted between each phrase. Paul was also educated. A person should not only recognize the value of the fast, but whether your fast continues 10 days, 2 weeks, 40 days, or longer, your bowels should move every few days. If a person does not drink water while the fast is in progress, how can these channels of elimination function properly? The drinking of water will continue the process of cleaning while the fast continues. If the bowels do not move, please do not worry. There is no cause for alarm. Some folks' bowels do not move at all during the entire fast. The drinking of water does not prevent one from drawing closer to God. Water is pure and is a type of salvation and of the Holy Spirit. John 4:14. 4, Water, unlike corruptible food, evaporates into the atmosphere while food goes back to the earth. Water is not stimulating while food is. Food feeds the appetites of carnality. Water does not. When an individual fasts, his pores become laden with toxins, especially his hands and face. Therefore, he should bathe externally as often as possible. In about two weeks, more or less, the average individual will have most of the waste, poisons, toxins, fecal materials, etc. eliminated. That is, unless this individual has a deep-seated functional ailment. Even if this be the case, this should be relieved and healed if the fast is continued. It is quite evident that Jesus took water while fasting 40 days. There are four things that bear evidence in this regard. Shall we study our Lord's fast? Matthew 4, 2-11 When he had fasted, We pointed that the definition of fasting does not exclude water drinking, and it does not mention that Jesus thirsted 40 days. In the scriptures, it is called a fast and not a thirst. He was afterward and hungered. It does not say that he afterward thirsted. When a person does without both food and drink, water means far more to him than food. A man can go days without food, but this same individual can go but a very short time without water. Especially is this true in a hot and torrid climate. It seems very evident that Jesus did drink water, for at the time of the feeding of the 4,000, bread and fishes were offered after they had been fasting for three days, and Jesus, according to Scripture, did not offer them water because they had no need of it. Water was available in the springs and brooks nearby. Satan knew that he wasn't thirsty because he did not tempt him with water. He said, Command that these stones be made bread. The answer that the Son of God gave to Satan is very evident. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This seems to prove that he had partaken of water, for he must notice in this connection the failure to mention water. You may ask if the fast that Jesus took was a supernatural one. No, this fast was not in any way a supernatural fast, for fasting is not supernatural. Whether it is done by our Lord or by the ones for whose salvation we, He paid the price, fasting is a science. Anyone can fast for long periods of time, but only the Christian can expect supernatural results. The fast of Jesus can be said to be natural, on the ground that after His fast, He hungered. The natural hunger that had left His body for a time returned again. This is true in any fast. If the fast is prolonged to its normal completion, when true hunger returns. Critics who say that only Jesus could fast 40 days and that no one else can do so are condemning something they know nothing about. They are in need of trying a fast themselves. Then they would realize with a great awakening the value of fasting. The argument is brought to us that Moses fasted 40 days. Please tell me what scripture states this. In Exodus 34, 28 through 29, we read, And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. This abstinence was not called fasting here, as failing to drink water is outside the meaning of the word. Why change the meaning of the word fasting? On the mount, Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days. 
This explains why Moses did not drink water. He was with the Lord, literally with the Lord. I am certain that if we were allowed to stand in His presence and be with God, we would neither have to eat, drink, or breathe, whether we were with Him 40 days or 40 years. Actually, the Lord Himself is our food, drink, and sustainer. This was true with Moses because of verse 29. The skin of his face shone while he talked with him. The children of Israel were actually afraid of Moses, for he had received supernatural radiation that was far more real than food and drink. He had to veil his face to talk to them. When Moses died, he had the strength and constitution of a young man. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. The world's largest alligator farm is in Los Angeles. Almost 2,000 alligators are in captivity. Upon a recent visit, I learned that the creatures entered into a suspended animation for six months out of every year. They do not eat, drink, or even breathe for six months out of the year. When it gets warm, they come out in their anti-world environment and gradually break into eating again. They have learned the art of eating, drinking, and breathing that is incomparable to anything we humans can do. This suspended animation may be comparable to Moses' 40-day food abstention without both food and water. If any person fasts without taking water, and he can do so if he wishes, I must say, Amen. However, any person can take short fasts of several days only without water, as well as food, and still receive spiritual benefits for their sacrifice. See Esther 4.16 Fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days. Doing without food will give you that spiritual uplift and power with or without water. This has been proven many times. This fact is true in the fact of a few days, but we are now dealing with long fast, which will give one power to do mighty things, seemingly the impossible. The fast that will break down denominational barriers and restore the body of Christ to its place of power and into the unity of faith. Dr. Tanner, who fasted over 40 days on three occasions, declared that in the second half of each of the three fasts, the unspeakable glories of the world beyond were revealed to him. Dr. Tanner lived to be 92 years of age and gave credit to fasting for his longevity of life. In Dr. Tanner's day, they ridiculed Christ's fast, saying nobody could fast that long. Dr. Tanner challenged them. His first fast lasted over 40 days and was under observation by his disbelievers. He was weighed and checked daily, thus he broke down the ridicule of fasting in his time. Dr. Tanner was a physician as well as a Christian. His first fast was so glorious. Black hair replaces that later on he took additional fasts of over 40 days. After his last fast, a crop of new black hair appeared in a place of the gray hair. Luther fasted for days at a time while translating the Bible, and herein undoubtedly lies the secret of his unrivaled translation, and it is also responsible for bringing the Reformation revival of his time. His great faith was likewise largely through the revelation of God's presence, which is revealed through prayer and fasting. Thank God for men that get a vision who will go all out. Lust, hunger. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yeah. They spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? God at first did not readily give them food as they did not actually need it. This food was wanted to satisfy an appetite of lust, which is habit hunger. God did, however, give them angels food and sent them meat to the full. He gave them their own desire, and they were destroyed. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. See Psalm 78, 29-34. A close study of the scriptures will show clearly that sin is sin. The partaking of an over amount of food is classed in the category of sin because the same damage is done to the body as by alcohol, tobacco, dope, etc. This fact is also emphasized by Jesus Christ when he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was tempted to command the stones to become food. Jesus' answer was not very effective, was very effective. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See Deuteronomy 8.3 and Matt 4.4. 4. Again, Jesus shows what value the world will place on food when the Son of Man cometh. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is not criticizing the eating to live, but he is greatly contemning the living to eat. 
that is so prevalent everywhere. It is a sign of the last days, the sign that tells us that the coming of our Lord draweth nigh. In Matthew 24, 37, 38, and Luke 21, 34, eating is placed ahead of drinking. Chapter 3, The Background for Revival Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Joel 2:15. To see our loved ones saved, souls converted, and a sweeping revival come in our midst. To have God work miracles and heal our diseases and pour out His Holy Spirit, we must first start a fast and prayer in the home. Lord, let it begin in me. Even if you are the only converted member of the family, you can get hold of God in such a way by fasting and prayer that Jesus, seeing your fervor and zeal, developing the faith for the salvation of your loved ones, will most certainly hear your prayer and convert them. Many times a year, a person has done this, and not only were the loved ones converted, but the Lord so rewarded them that an old-fashioned revival swept the whole community, saving, healing, and blessing mightily with the Spirit. In 1932, the Holy Spirit led the author into his first revival meeting. He knew only three families in the Oklahoma oil town, Nawata. One of these families believed and practiced fasting and prayer. Together we prayed and fasted ahead of time for the meeting that we knew God was going to give us. The foundation was properly laid for a revival, and a revival we certainly did have. There was no building big enough to take care of the crowd, so we secured three acres of ground and had an open-air meeting. This was in July. People packed the place from the first service. We kept building seats, and the crowd continued to increase every evening. People gathered from all over northeastern Oklahoma and southeastern Kansas for the meetings. Scores of people were healed of all types of afflictions. One lady who had been in a car wreck with broken ribs was carried to the services on pillows. She was instantly healed. A deaf and dumb boy was enabled to hear and speak. A man who could not lift his arm and had been paralyzed was healed of his paralysis and was able to lift his arm. Many more received notable healings. Folks were under the power of a spirit. Many were baptized. Within three months from the time we started the meeting, we built a church and got it paid for so that the people could continue to have a place to worship in truth and in spirit. All of these results were traced directly to prayer and fasting. My brother assisted me in the meeting. The church is still progressing for the glory of God to this day. Fasting for the home. If church leaders and parents, the heads of churches and homes, do not live up to the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, how can we expect our children to be saved? Fasting was as surely a part of the faith that was once delivered unto the saints as anything else. Fasting is one of the great foundational peers of the Christian religion. The structure of the Christian religion is built upon the vital truth of prayer and fasting. It was a vital part of the early church. Therefore, the great results that accompanied it were seen in those early days. The lack of fasting explains the great falling away, the losing their first love, because man cares more for his desire nature than for the fortification of his soul. People have failed to follow the complete pattern of the faith formula of Christ, given in Matthew chapter 17 or Mark 9, 29. They do not only failed to have power to do the impossible, but after the days of the apostles, the church became powerless and eventually began to say that the days of healing were over, that miracles were not for them anymore. The Holy Spirit, after the Bible pattern was forsaken and the power of the apostolic age was lost, many splits soon divided the church of Jesus Christ. The men of old that had fasted and prayed and who had power with God to perform miracles of healing had either died or had been martyred. The younger generations discontinued the use of fasting. Matthew 9.15 The days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast. How many children of the bridegroom are obeying Christ's commands? Then shall they fast. It is here that our Lord lays upon us as the children of the bridegroom the duty of fasting when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. Then they shall fast. And as long as our bridegroom tarries, just so long should we continue to fast until that happy day when he returns and fasting need to be no more. It wasn't as necessary to fast while Jesus was here on earth because he had fasted to obtain the more perfect faith. After he left, we could have had through fasting the same power and faith that his visible presence gave. 
Indian tribes practice fasting. Many, if not all, the American Indian tribes sought revelation of the Great Spirit through prayer and fasting. When they had famines, food shortages, lack of rain, etc., the Great Spirit was sought through prayer and fasting, and their prayers were answered. And certain tribes, nearly all Indian children who became to the age of pu puberty, were set aside in prayer, children fasting, and a fast of seven to ten days to burn out, so to speak, the evil sex desire so that they would have high moral thoughts and live a high spiritual life. As they grew and developed into manhood or womanhood, the practice of fasting was continued. Is not this a lesson for the American home of today? If this method were taught and put into practice in our day, we would not see as many disobedient sons and daughters who are the source of such grief and heartaches to their parents. A survey was recently disclosed by a writer of the well-known periodical The Presbyterian, which reveals facts that are alarming. Out of 49 million young people in the U.S., 36 million have never set foot inside any church of any creed. This same writer in another survey learned from questionnaires sent to 55,000 children of school age that 16,000 of them had never heard of the Ten Commandments, let alone quote the Lord's Prayer, fasting for children. Fasting is beneficial to children. When a child becomes ill, very often several meals or several days fasting will fix up everything. Many children, as they grow and eat rich foods, develop a pimpled complexion. The source of the condition is in the stomach. The stomach tries to unload its poisonous material in the blood and to some extent through the skin. Only a few days of fasting will eradicate all traces of the symptoms. If proper eating is undertaken, it should not return. Scores of minor and major ailments of young people could be whipped by a short fast. Girls would find it necessary to wear makeup. If they would fast and pray more, a natural healthy complexion would be the result. Babies quite frequently suffer from overfeeding rather than underfeeding. If one considers how small a baby is and analyzes the great quantity of food that is given to him in proportion to the food of an enormous adult, one would find it huge. Adults would have to drink 21 quarts of milk daily to be the equivalent of a baby's food. The colic, gases in the stomach, belching, vomiting, diarrhea, and many other baby disturbances can be quickly eliminated by a fast of one or more meals. Methodist ministers get churches revived. Dear Brother Hall, I am a Methodist minister who received your book two years ago. After fasting and praying 10 days for a revival in three Methodist churches that 1 a.m. in charge of, God stirred and sent revivals in our midst. The Lord richly blessed us in many ways. A Roman Catholic and his Protestant wife were among these gloriously saved. And one of my churches, an Italian lady to whom I gave one of our books, one of your books, went on a fast of 23 days for her old Catholic mother who came from the old country, was blind and about to die. She was praying to beads and images. She became interested in Jesus and learned how to pray to the Lord. Finally, she was gloriously saved. The lady who fasted 23 days was hopelessly afflicted with kidney stones. The doctor could do nothing for her and said an operation would be necessary. Well, praise the Lord, she has not had an attack since her fast two years ago. Before I became acquainted with fasting, my people said, We have never heard of fasting. I said, Bless your heart. Have you never read your Bible? Pray for me as I work in these Methodist churches and kindly send a good supply of pamphlets on fasting. Yours in him, R.B. Crape. Woodhine.